serve our community. So um, if, if you're interested in supporting a program like that, um, we also have a yoga program. We did have Blue Cross uh, supporting that the last five years. So we are looking for someone to support that program as well. Um, but I'm going to wrap it up quick. I've only been asked to speak for a couple of minutes. Uh, again, thanks to Vendasta for supporting uh, Karen Scher and uh, St. Mike's School. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Next up, I'd like to invite Danny uh, up to the stage to talk a little bit about Vendasta. Hey, guys. How many people here are with an agency? How many here are, uh, do research and development? Yeah, that's what I figured. <laughs> so uh, is there anyone here that's not familiar with what Vendasta does? I'm still trying, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tony, <laughs> he works here, just to be clear. But you know what, that's a bit of a common sentiment in the few first months when you do start here. I've worked here for about seven or eight months and I am the director essentially of uh, corporate marketing and communication. It took me a long while to sort it all out and make sure that I really understood it and I'm still, we're still refining it. But so any anyone that's from external knows, what we do do is we create sales and marketing software that's made for a power user and essentially it helps local businesses, the end user, conquer their digital marketing so that they can be competitive. So we sell to people like media companies and marketing and ad agencies so they can then go out to their local businesses all over the world and sell that software and, and just make their digital footprints stronger. So we do all the stuff that's, uh, that's connected with that, uh, products and services and we continue to grow every day and we are one of the fastest growing companies in Canada. So. Um, People often ask if it's as much fun here as people say, and I would say 100% uh, seven or eight months in, it is. We have a social committee that puts on events every month that you can attend. Uh, we just recently went to the Ryder game, there was paintball, and it's usually free of charge, or there's a deeply discounted um, uh, you know, cost of going. You can bring your, your friends, and it's a great time to, to connect with the people that you work with and, and their loved ones. Uh, we also have a volunteer group that will that gets involved in the community clearly. Um, we have flexible time for R&D, so if you start at a certain hour and you end at a certain hour, as long as you get, you're getting your hours in uh, and getting your work done, then there's a real flexible schedule. So anyways, long and short of it is, it's really fun to work here. Uh, it's something to consider, and we do have a small booth uh, over there. You'll see a couple ladies there. There's Celine waving, yeah. So you can go over there if you want to learn a little bit more. That's all I have to say. Craig? Thank you, Danny. I just want to give a, another shout out for another event that's happening this weekend. Uh, MedHack. Eric Tetland, uh, who is a developer here right now, is helping with this event. It's an event, uh, a hackathon to generate ideas in the medical space because doctors don't know anything about technology. Developers don't know anything about cutting people open. So joining them together, we think there could be some really great ideas. It's to this weekend, starts at 7 o'clock tonight. The talks start at uh, the Innovation Place in the Galleria building. So you have time to watch everything here and still make it for the event there tonight. Uh, I'd like to start uh, the event tonight. Uh, developer tr tradition here at Vendasta has become that every day at 345, everyone gets, a lot of developers get together and play Hacksball. Uh, Ryan LaForge tells me he's the best at Hacksball, so shots fired. Uh, Ryan has been with us for three years now. He's really been digging into Angular and reactive programming since we started using it. This is a, he really cares about the quality of code he writes. This is his first talk in front of a large audience, so uh, go easy on him, but please give a warm welcome for Ryan. Thanks for the introduction, Craig. I don't know if I said I was the best at Hacksball, so I'm pretty sure I'll hear about that after the talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> just making sure my screen's set up right here for the projector. It's good? It's good. Cool. 
Ready to go? Uh, actually, give me one, one minute here. Good enough. Okay, I'm excited to see that so many of you came out tonight. Um, I'll be introducing reactive programming, and I'll go over it at a kind of higher, higher level, and I really want to nail down some of the core ideologies around it. So a little bit about me. I've been a developer here at Vendacity for three years. Of those three years, I actually spent 16 months on an internship program, which has really helped me grow into the person I am today. And I only graduated back in 2017, so I'm still kind of, kind of fresh. I'm going to gonna go over the why, what, and the how, and kind of provide some examples of reactive programming. Then I'll touch base on the functional stuff and how that can help us. So we've all been in this situation before. We've all been tasked with working on an application that's highly coupled or is large and monolithic. It's difficult to work with. Making changes in one area might impact something or another module down, down the road, maybe even something that you didn't know existed. So it's almost like trying to pull a spaghetti noodle out of a bowl without, tr without pulling any of the other noodles along with it and without trying to rip that noodle. That's quite difficult and that can, that can burn us out. What we want is we want to deal with cleaner code. We want to deal with code that we can write and go home at the end of the day feeling proud of and excited to work on the next day. And so that's where some of the benefits of reacti uh, reactive programming can help us out. It significantly reduces coupling. You're more loosely coupled to an event stream rather than having your services directly communicate with one another. And allows you to really focus in on the business logic. You worry a lot less about the minute details and, and all those little finicky bits that are annoying to deal with. And it also makes it much easier to reason about asynchronous tasks. Well, how does it do that? Let's talk about what it is. At the heart of it, reactive programming is made up of three core concepts an event stream, the propagation of change throughout your system, and responding to those events asynchronously. And so an event stream is simply just a sequence of events ordered throughout time. They can represent anything. They could represent a user clicking a button on your web page, could represent input from the keyboard, could represent a signal from a physical device, etc. And as our applications grow more and more real time in the modern day, the source of those, the number of sources for those events really starts to grow. So what your modules will do is they'll subscribe to this stream and then they'll react to those events asynchronously. Now there's a few different ways that change is usually propagated throughout a system. I'll talk about two here. The first is the observer pattern. And the observer pattern, what happens is observers register interest in the observable. And then when something of note happens, the observable pushes out to the observers and tells them, hey, something interesting happened. Uh, the observable knows about the observers, usually through some sort of interface. There's also a publish and subscribe idea here. Now imagine that a publisher pushes out to a channel or an event bus, or in our case, an event stream. And subscribers simply subscribe to that event stream and are notified of those events in the order that they occur in. And they're guaranteed to be notified. So the publisher doesn't know about any of the subscribers, and the subscribers don't know about the publisher, or doesn't know if there's multiple publishers involved. And that resembles a lower degree of coupling and can really help you out. And like I said, you respond to these events asynchronously. It shouldn't matter the order those asynchronous events are executed. If it starts to matter, usually that's a code smell, and it's going to lead to problems for you down the road. So. I want to look at the difference between the imperative style that we're all used to, the style that we were taught in school, executing a sequence of instructions to arrive at a desired outcome. And I want to talk about how that's different from the reactive style. So in the imperative world, if a change in module A necessitated changes in modules B, C, or D, or other modules, A would usually call through to those other modules through some sort of set or update function, or you might have some some other abstraction in, 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 in the way there. In the reactive world, instead what happens is module A would push out an event to that stream, 
and modules B, C, and D would subscribe to it and be notified of those events. So what's cool about this is you can add modules to that stream, listeners to that stream, without changing the modules that are pushing to that stream. And you could have any number of modules pushing to that stream and they don't have to know about any of the subscribers. So let's dig a little bit deeper here and talk about managing dependencies. Now this is a very trivial example, but I want you to imagine how this could scale up in an application. So you have a number of variables of which C, D, and E have dependencies. A and B don't, they're just, they, they don't have any dependencies. And you wanna manage what's there. So when I say C equals A plus D B, that's something you'd like to keep consistent throughout the runtime of your, uh, of your application. So if you change B, well now you gotta, up, up, gotta update C. And when you change C, now you gotta update D. And when if you change A, it gets even worse. You have to do even more updates. And the order that you execute these statements in really matters. And so, in a larger application, you might start to feel like poor Fry here when you're trying to manage all those dependencies. In the reactive world, what you do here is, well, I kind of wrote a little bit of an abstraction. It's okay, it's pseudocode, I can do that. When you see watch A and B, that means watch those variables for changes. And when you see and add, it means watch A and B and run this function on them. And that's one of the core ideas behind reactive programming. So now I can declare my dependencies up front. C depends on A and B, and when either of them change, just run the add function and assign that to C. So now when I change A, it, I don't have to worry about those dependencies anymore. I declared them up front, and it's okay from then on in. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Let's look at an example of login. Let's say you want three things to happen when a user logs into your app. You want the login link to switch to logout, You'd like to track the event to Google Analytics so you can make wise business decisions. And you'd like to retrieve and cache the user settings so your app can respond appropriately. On the imperative world, your login service would have to call methods on those other services. Track for the analytics service, maybe it's retrieve settings for the setting service, etc. That resembles a higher degree of coupling. If you wanted to add another login service there, that service would also have to know about those three list, the, the, those th three other services, analytics, navigations, and settings. And if you wanted to add another service that cared about login, you'd have to change the login service. And let's say you want to find all the places in your code that you track an event. You want to know all the events that you track in analytics. What do you do? Well, maybe you start by looking at the analytics service. But all you see there is a track event method. What are your options? Your options is, are to use fine usages and look throughout your entire application for where that method's called. That might not be a large problem in a small application. You might only have two or three calls. But in a large application, you can imagine that you begin to have dozens of these calls. And while you're trying to figure out what's going on, you have to keep all that in your mind or you have to write it down somewhere. And it's a little bit difficult to get a grasp of how the analytic service works. In the reactive world, the login service simply pushes an event out to that event stream. The analytics service would listen to that event stream and track the event. The setting service would simply listen to it and go and retrieve those user settings. And may maybe make it available to something else that cares about settings. And to find all the places that you, tr the, uh, or all the uh, events that you care about tracking, all you have to do now is look in the analytics service because they're all there. You just have a reference to all the streams that are gonna be, for all the events that are gonna be tracked and you might merge, map, and subscribe over them. So I threw three functions at you. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what they do now. So if you're curious about learning more about reactive programming, you could look at the Re reactive extensions library. It's a polyglot library or multi-language library that provides you utility functions that allow you to do things like combine and transform and filter your streams in new and interesting ways. So there you see a marble diagram. It takes the top stream and it filters the events from those streams down into a second stream. And a subscriber could listen to any of those streams. So in this example, let's say you have part of your application that occurs about prime numbers for some reason, and you want to add 10 to them. Well, first you have an event stream that's just composed of numbers. You apply a filter to it. Now you just have prime numbers. Then you can transform it and add 10 to it. And so you you can see how you can kind of manipulate these streams in interesting ways. And subscribers could attach themselves to either one of these streams at any point. So now I want to talk a little bit about 
functional programming. There's a lot of buzzwords that are thrown around with functional. There's higher order functions, closures, referential transparency, etc. I only want to focus on two here that I think can really help with reactive programming. The first is the notion of a pure function. And pure functions are awesome. I love them. They're easy to test. They only depend on their inputs and they'll give you the same output every time you give them the same input and they don't have any side effects. So they have something called referential transparency. Essentially means if you replace that function call with the output from that function everywhere in your application, it won't change the meaning of your application. So on the left there, you see an example of an impure function. And on the right, you see an example of a pure function. Now why the impure function may be a problem is you might be coding along and you might end up calling what's an impure function. You might not know right away that it's impure. And so down the flow of, of, flow of execution, a bug surfaces. And it might be difficult for you to track that bug back to this impure function, especially if it's hidden away in a library or something. So there's the, there's the output. You can see that the impure function mutates the original reference, and the second one doesn't. It just creates a copy. So now I want to talk about the notion of immutability. Mutability means something is subject to change. So immutability means that it doesn't change. And I would argue that you should never mutate the event references on your event stream. That could cause a really annoying problem. And so the example here is, let's say these modules receive the event in the order from left to, left to right. So the left module operates properly, doesn't do anything wrong, doesn't mutate that event. It's, it's a good guy. The middle module, doesn't have a bug, it acts properly, but it's a bad guy. It mutates that event. And that event is passed along to the module on the right. Well, uh, the bug surfaces in the module on the right, even though that module didn't do anything wrong. It's the mutation in the middle module that caused that problem. To make matters worse, you can't guarantee the order that these uh, asynchronous tasks will be executed in. So you might have this scenario here, or you might have a mutation of the event that happens after everything else runs, and you might not see a bug. Or you might mutate the event first and have multiple bugs throughout your application. And so it may start to get really hard to track down where that bug came from, and you might pull your hair out doing it. So some common examples if you want to learn more about reactive programming would be callbacks, which really just talks about asynchronicity. There's no event streams there. Redux, which I'm pretty sure a lot of you have heard of that. Um, you could look at the reacti reactive extensions library that I mentioned, or Elm, a JavaScript framework that's sh kind of showing that, there, that it's not running into any runtime errors. Instead, it's all caught at compile time, which is awesome. So to wrap up, I've talked about why you should care about reactive programming. I dived into three core concepts, event streams, a sequence of events ordered in time. I talked about the propagation of change throughout your application and responding to those events asynchronously. I also brought up immutability, and that you should try to reduce the amount of mutation that goes on in your code. And I talked about pure functions, functions that only depend on their inputs and will give you the same outputs every time without any side effects. So that's the talk. Are there any, are there any questions? I'll remind people. 50-50 tickets for anyone who asks questions. <laughs> Yeah, that was a part of the agreement, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we're good. Oh, we got one over there. Uh, so as far as reactive programming goes, are there downsides that you would want to avoid? Or like you mentioned the bugs, but are there other big pros and cons that you think you know, maybe are worth looking into as well? Um, the downsides that I've kind of heard of are kind of happen when you're, you're either building a really simple application and bringing in the reactive programming paradigm might be a little bit too much overhead, or you're doing something wrong. Um, it, also has a <laughs> it also has a bit of a steeper learning curve. So I mean, there is that. It's a little bit more difficult to learn. But I think the benefits drastically outweigh the cons. Thanks. All right, everyone give Ryan a hand. Thanks. Okay, we're going to take a 15-minute break here. Uh, everyone can then go grab another drink, grab some food, and then we'll get back with the other two talks.
Good afternoon, everybody. So just to let you know, this is our two-minute warning. We're going to get started up again in about two minutes. So if you want to refresh your drinks, grab another snack, uh, we'll be getting started with our second presentation in about two minutes. Test. All right, everybody, we're going to get back to the talks here. If you could just uh, grab a seat. Our next presenter is Chris Penner. Chris is passionate about functional program. Functional program. Feel to free to ask him. Give us a second. Just wait till it quiets down for a second. Our next presenter is Chris Penner. Chris is passionate, passionate about functional programming. Feel free to ask him how monads are like burritos. Uh, also, he really loves Vim. Uh, he thinks it's a, actually an IDE, and he's trying to convince everyone else to use it. And he's got another problem. He's trying to get everyone to use Haskell. But we like him anyways, and please welcome Chris. Uh, actually, monads are more like tacos, but uh, we'll talk about that after. All right. So we're uh, going to do a bit of a history lesson today. I know uh, most of you thought that you were done with that uh, after second year of arts and sciences, but uh, we'll, we'll give it another run here. Okay, I think we're all good to go. Cool. Cool. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of abstraction today. So as programmers, obviously, um, abstraction is one of the first things that we learn about. And it's actually one of the key tools in our toolbox as we go through things. So we're going to go back in time uh, to go to's. Uh, some of you, well, hopefully, actually, most of the newer programmers in the audience have never needed to touch these. Uh, we're going to start off with the good things about go to's and how they helped with programming back in the day. Okay, moving on. Uh, actually, in all honesty, they were the first kind of attempt 
that people got into with abstraction. So they realized that they were writing a lot of code that they would need to copy paste. And if you wanted to run something more than once, you would basically need to, oh, okay, I'll copy this sequence of instructions, put them down here. And then if you needed to change one thing about them, well, you had to go through and you had to change every single spot that you used it. So it did provide code reuse. Uh, you could set up little blocks and jump back into them with go-tos. And they gave you primitive control flow as well. Um, they were actually used as some of the, the first ways of imp implementing if statements, right? So you could check some parameter, and if it was true, you could jump back using a go-to uh, to a previous block of code, or you could jump forward to some return condition or something like that. Uh, but they had a lot of downsides. One was that they lacked parametricity. So if you're using a go-to, wherever you jump to, well, it's just going to re-execute that code with whatever the application state happens to be in at that time. You had no control. It could edit anything. It burned down a lot of buildings and houses and all sorts of things, probably. Um, not composable either. So these units that GoTo's operated over were not well defined. Um, if you jump up here, you could, you know, follow that code all the way down to the rest of your program. Uh, it was really difficult to tell which chunks the GoTo's operated over. So we smartened up, we moved on, uh, and we came up with functions, which honestly we're still using every single day. Pretty sure this was one of the good ideas that we've had as programmers, one of the few, um, because they provide encapsulation and in, uh, composability. So two of those things that were missing from GoTo's, functions helped solve that. Uh, encapsulation, uh, for those who haven't heard this word before, is the basic idea that if you have a function, it's a, a named unit of computation. So you can give it a name and say, hey, this function um, does this thing. It logs in the user. And you know you had to write it once, but after that, when you came back to it, you could see, oh, this logs in the user. OK, I don't need to read into that. I can trust, well, usually you can trust that it does what it says. Um, and you can use it again and again and again anywhere that you come across that need. They also offer composability, which is the idea that they are typically self-contained units which don't mess around too much uh, with anything else, which means if you need to do one thing and then do another thing, uh, you can run the first function, get some output from that, and feed it into the next function. And they uh, actually allow you to tie together, like Lego blocks, the pieces of your program in a really nice, clean way. So uh, most of you are probably familiar with how functions work. Um, but here's a, a quick little uh, demo of, of two functions here. So we've got the length function, uh, which goes from a string, so like a, a bunch of characters, like a name or a word or something like that. And let's say we can get the length of that as some integer, okay? So it goes from a string to an integer. Uh, and we have another function that goes from an integer to a bool, and it actually just says whether that integer is even. It's either true or it's false. So three is odd, so that'd be false, and two is even, so it's true. Uh, one thing you'll notice, inside those squares, we have no clue how the programmer has chosen to implement length or even. We just trust that it works, it's encapsulated, and we can understand what it's supposed to do. At the bottom, we compose those two functions. So we've got length composed with even, which means uh, if we know we can go from a string to an integer and an integer to a Boolean, well, if we just plug those things together, we can go straight from a string into a Boolean and say whether the length of some uh, word is even. Uh, it gives those two properties really nice. And in larger programs, we end up using that a lot. Here's a very small program, uh, which we're just going to try and show a post. Uh, we're writing a blog or something like uh, all programmers do every day. Um, and we're going to accept a post ID. So that's that parametricity I was talking about. Unlike GoTo's, we can run this block of code, and we can actually swap out which post ID we're going to operate over. Um, so we get the post uh, on that first line there, then we get the comments, and then we can build the post and we can return it. Um, that gives us that composability, right? So we call the function and we get a, uh, a built page out of it, and we can use that for whatever we want, wherever we are. Uh, you can see, though, that this kind of has some sort of inherent linearity to the order of the statements inside that function. So if you were to run this in JavaScript, for instance, it would first get the post, and then it would get the comments, and then it would build the page, 
okay? Um, so it does each step one after the other. Well, at some point in our history, uh, computers learned to do more than one thing at a time. Turns out that's handy. Uh, and the, this way that this function is constructed doesn't really reflect that. Can we somehow represent this idea of doing more than one thing at a time and coordinating those efforts using a function and a set of statements like that? Uh, so we're just going to look at a scoreboard here. This will come up a, a couple times throughout the talk. Uh, we can realize there that go-tos are just straight failing off the board. Um, we're going to forget about those real quick here. Uh, but functions, uh, we can see that they're parametric and composable. However, they really fall short when it comes to doing things asynchronously or doing things at the same time. There's no real way just using functions and statements to represent things that may be happening at the same time and how we want to coordinate that. So we need to advance. We need to evolve. Uh, functions weren't good enough. Uh, we need Katy Perry. Um, so we uh, moved on to callbacks, or something um, also known as continuation passing style in some of the older languages, uh, like Scheme, for instance. But this is one of those things that was really popularized by Node. Um, when Node came out and it was doing all of these file streams and um, crazy uh, calling out over HTTP and all of that stuff, uh, it really popularized this idea of handling asynchronous tasks. Callbacks build on top of functions. So it's they use functions under the hood, and uh, they just employ them in slightly different ways with different semantics. So they build on these functions to provide that asynchronicity, and something called multiplicity, which I definitely made up, but uh, we're going to go with it. It's basically the idea that you can do something one or more times, or I guess zero or more times. A function takes one output and returns one output. Or sorry, one input and returns one output every single time. Every time you call it, it will return something eventually, as long as it you know doesn't light your computer on fire or wait until the heat death of the universe. Um, callbacks, on the other hand, <laughs> have this notion that you tell them kind of what you would like to do, and they can do that zero times if they just you know don't feel like it, or they can run it many times with different output um, as many times as they want. So this turns out to be pretty handy. Uh, we'll first dig into asynchronicity. I mentioned Node earlier. This is just using the file system um, module in Node to read a file. It's a little tough to read there, but all we're doing is we're going to read the file called my file, and we pass it actually that second parameter is a callback. It's a function. Uh, and that function is going to log out that data. Now, when is it going to log out that data? Well, we don't actually know. Um, depends, right? So if the disk is really, really slow, it might log that file out tomorrow. Um, if it's super snappy SSD, it might log it out before we even can notice. But the idea is that it's nonlinear, right? The execution of the program will continue past this statement and something will happen in the background eventually. Here's an example of multiplicity, again using JavaScript. Um, we're just going to set up an array there of the five numbers and we're going to use the for each function. Now most people don't think of for each as being um, asynchronous because it's not, but it does have this notion of multiplicity. We give it some sort of uh, task to do and it will do that zero or more times. So this is a benefit over top of just plain functions. In this case, it will run it five times, but next time maybe the array is different, it'll run it two times, or maybe the array is empty and it won't run it at all. So this is this concept of multiplicity. We might run something more than once. Uh, here's our score scoreboard. We can see that callbacks are doing okay. We've got the parametricity, they're asynchronous, and they can handle multiplicity, but we have lost that ability to compose Callbacks do not compose very nicely. If you've ever seen a JavaScript program uh, longer than five lines written in early versions of Node, you'll notice the triangle of doom. Everything, you have to just write it in that callback and write it into the next callback. And we can see that in small form here. We're moving off to the right. Um, we can get the post, but because this sends a callback here, we need to do the next statement inside that callback if we want to access the information. Uh, and we need to do it again inside the second callback. And then what we can do is we can actually call 
whichever callback this function was called uh, with the page. So that, that gets a little bit confusing, um, which is actually the point that I'm trying to illustrate. So hopefully you are all confused at this point uh, and we can move on. Um, so you'll also notice that the way that we do this, it's actually, even though it is asynchronous, we're still kind of linear in our data dependencies, right? We can't get the comments until we have the post because there's no way for us to coordinate two of those callbacks and bring them back together. So what did we really gain here? Well, the rest of the program can keep executing, but we haven't sped up this individual task at all. What we really want is something like this. Getting the post and getting the comments are independent tasks from one another. We want to run them at the same time and then build the page whenever both of them are done. And that's the level of coordination uh, that these asynchronous callbacks can't really give us. Also, the composition, uh, we would like it if we could build that page and then keep using it for something down the line. But with callbacks, it's just really, really messy to do that. Uh, so we move on to promises. And this is, again, uh, something that the JavaScript community thought that they invented but has actually existed for years. Um, <laughs> And it is one way to solve this problem. So promises, again, building on the previous abstraction, uh, is the next evolution. Harder, better, faster, stronger. Uh, they allow us to build on callbacks and regain those things that we've lost. So composability. And they also add in the ability to coordinate these asynchronous processes. So we can uh, fork and join these asynchronous processes bring them back together, run some computation on the individual parts, and continue on with our program. Here's one um, example of the previous bit of code using these promises. So you can see now, instead of uh, using a callback or immediately returning the value, we actually return some promise, which is um, basically a value that represents some computation, which will eventually finish at some point. We do the same thing with comments. Then we can use this combinator provided by promises, which allows us to do coordination. So we can say, hey, I've got these two things that are kind of happening. Well, now I want to use both of them. So I want you to wait until both of them have finished, join those computations back together, and then we can build this page. And you'll notice that the flow of this function is very flat, right? We haven't gone far off to the right because these promises are composable. And at the end of the day, we actually return another promise, which means whoever is calling this function can continue to use those dot then chains and keep on going with their life. Okay, uh, we also have some cool new syntax, which makes this a lot easier in modern JavaScript. It's called async await. Um, you can look that up on your own if you're interested. So back to the scoreboard. Um, we've got these promises, and we were really close to uh, perfection. Looks like we've lost our multiplicity. Shoot, promises can actually only resolve a single time it's in the spec. Once a promise is finished, well, it's not going to trigger again, which is really, turns out, it's really nice for a lot of situations, but uh, that multiplicity was really nice for that for each, right? We might need that at some point. And I've also introduced a new concept here called reactivity, which Ryan talked about a little bit earlier. It's the idea that if something changes, you want the rest of your system to re-update, react, and uh, trigger again. We, we need multiplicity in order to do that. Uh, so we evolve again. Here we are at streams, okay? Um, streams are the next evolution in our levels of abstraction, and they build on promises. They regain that multiplicity and add in reactivity. So they uh, allow us to do those two things that callbacks kind of allowed, but we keep our composition and we keep the ability to chain our programs together in small units. So uh, like I talked about with reactivity, it's the idea that if something changes, we can update the rest of the program. So this is exactly the same as the previous graph with one difference. I have dotted lines now. So what that means <laughs> is that um, this post here is no longer a get post function. It's a post stream. Ooh, fancy. That means that it can send new posts down the stream whenever that post is, for instance, updated. Uh, and same with the comments. If someone adds a new comment, we can send it down the stream and we can collect it down at the other end. Now, the nice thing is, is we don't have to wait for all of the possible comments that could ever be submitted to be s to 
do any work, we can get the first couple and then we can build a page out of those and we can say, oh, anytime someone sends a new one, I want to build a new page using those new comments. This is that idea of reactivity, which is very popular in front-end frameworks because oftentimes the user's clicking around, typing on things, we're pulling new information from the internet all over the place. And having a paradigm that allows us to tie all of that together is really important. Um, here is that same example written uh, using a reactive framework. So we've got our two streams here. This looks very similar to promises at this point. Uh, the dollar signs just denote that it's a stream, it's a convention. Uh, it's not doing anything special at the language level. Now, we have this new combinator here. It's called combine latest, and it's a primitive in most stream frameworks. And what it says is, normally I would use a function here and I would just take those two values and compute something and return something else but we want it to be reactive. So I want to combine the latest value from each of these streams using this computation. And the computation in this case is just to build that page. Um, this combinator, it will be implementation dependent. So however your streams are, are implemented, maybe it uses that observer pattern that Ryan mentioned, maybe it uses um, something, something else like Elm or Haskell do, um, but it will react every time something new happens. So we've added streams in. Uh, I've got a lot of nice check marks there. That's looking pretty good. Uh, let's see kind of what we can do with it that is now enabled uh, by the fact that we are aware of asynchronicity and multiplicity and reactivity. So what does this actually buy us? Well, in order to do that, we need to use some combinators. So functions, they really just have one thing you can do with them. You can apply them and you can get the result. That's it. That's really all that they're good for. You can pass them around. Um, streams, however, because they have all of this complexity, um, have a few cool things that we can just build in. Uh, in order to take advantage of the cool things that they can do, we need some additional help. So this is a marble diagram. Ryan showed uh, one or two of these. The basic idea is that the top represents our input stream. So from left to right, things are happening over time. So let's say over time, uh, we open the app and event one fires, and then we wait a little bit. Event two fires, a little bit later. Event three fires, later. Event four fires. Now, we're running it through this combinator first, and we get an output stream. So uh, this point here lines up in time across the two. And you can notice first is one of the combinators that expresses multiplicity. The way that it's going to express that is it's actually going to get rid of the multiplicity. So it's going to fire exactly once for the first event that we receive, basically reducing our stream down to a function, but that's something that we can only actually even talk about if we have this notion of time. Um, this is a different one, it's called buffer time. And what it says is, I'm gonna wait 30 seconds or 30 milliseconds, whichever, and I'm going to collect all of the events or all of the inputs that happen in that time. Now, if this was a function, each time we get an input, we would immediately compute the output. But we can talk about time now. So we're going to collect A and B, and then once 30 seconds triggers, well, we're gonna omit both A and B as a list, okay? Then we're gonna wait another 30 seconds, and oh, it looks like C happens within that amount of time. We'll omit that. Then we'll wait another 30 seconds. So this is one way that we can use streams to talk about events that are happening in the real world. Uh, they can also be asynchronous and talk about just strictly time. This one doesn't have to do with anything with changing the number of inputs to the number of outputs. It just, once it gets something, it waits 20 seconds, then emits that exactly. So this is a mirror of the original stream uh, where each event is delayed by 20 seconds. Um, they also demonstrate the parametric and composable properties that functions already had. Um, this is a simple transformation. It takes a function um, called map. Uh, so map is one of the functions. It takes an event, transforms it, and emits it immediately. So you can see it's just changing each of these numbers by multiplying it by 10. Okay, and here's this combined latest that we were using earlier. This diagram is a mess. Uh, not going to mince words, um, but basically you can kind of see if you squint that it's taking the last event in each stream at any given point of time and just combining the combination of those two events. Okay, so 
Now that we've got all these combinators, you don't have to memorize them, there's no test, um, but we can build more complex systems. So I'm not really going to go into harsh detail with this, but we can imagine we have some input, input box on the screen. Um, the user could type in that at any point, so we're going to have a stream of outputs of what the user has typed at any given point. Uh, we can debounce it. This is one of the primitives that talks about time. It will wait for two seconds and just collect the latest thing that had happened. So uh, we don't want to respond immediately to every key press because if we're making an API call, that would get taxing. Um, so we're going to wait for two seconds, collect everything that's happened, run it once, wait another two seconds. Uh, we're going to use with latest from, which is very similar to combine latest, and we're just going to get any filters that they've set up on the page. Let's say we're building a search screen. Uh, then we can use something called switch map. I'm going through this really quick. Don't worry about it. Um, switch map will take the things coming down the stream and combine it with some other stream and basically fork out and rejoin that asynchronous result. So we're going to run an API call, and then we're going to wait for that to finish and emit any results from that. Uh, and then we can render those results to screen. So here's kind of what a dependency graph of that would look like. Um, and we can actually talk about this in a well-structured way because of the way that streams compose. Um, with these combinators, they can join and fork out computations and do some really cool, complicated things. Some languages can actually statically analyze this graph. Uh, not JavaScript, but uh, other languages like Elm and Haskell can actually do some work at compile time and figure out these dependencies in a really cool way. Uh, and they can use that to do cycle detection. So do you have infinite loops in your program? Or do some optimization. Hey, this whole chunk of your program is completely unused. Let's throw that thing away. Um, or visualization. So they can actually maybe generate a graph like I just showed automatically for you uh, when you compile your program. And you can be like, oh, yeah, hmm, I don't know what's going on here, but it kind of looks right. Um, and we can talk about composability. So we can basically chop off any part of this computation and say, hey, uh, as long as I have some input coming in, uh, I can get some output coming out, and I can use that again somewhere else in my program. I can give it a name, um, just like functions compose. So really great things here. Each chunk is responsible for its own concurrency and asynchronicity, uh, which means basically in larger programs that use locks or older concurrency primitives, you have to worry about, is this idea of a data race or a race condition leaking out from this function? Is it sharing data? I don't really know what's happening. Well, like Ryan talked about, these streams are pure, right? They emit um, isolated chunks of data and compute things independently from everywhere else. It's actually very similar to the actor pattern if you guys have taken a concurrency class. Uh, and as a result, maybe this part of the program is concurrent within itself, but nowhere else in the program needs to worry about that. Uh, it's all baked into these primitives. So basically, if you use the primitives uh, and they all wire up and your types check, you're going to have a good time. You won't run into uh, any sort of data races or anything like that. Um, these primitives handle a lot of these concurrency problems for you. So if you have multiple event sources coming in, you don't need locks. You just call a merge. Uh, if you need a worker pool to do a lot of work at once, you can use a primitive called merge map, which forks out computations and joins them in when they finish. Um, if you need rate limiting, you can debounce your streams like we talked about with the input box, or you can use a timer to trigger things um, after a, a certain amount of time. In summary, when you use these streams, the next level of abstraction, programs are composable and modular by default. You can just take any chunk of your program put a name on it, and reuse it anywhere you want with basically zero downsides. Um, as I said, concurrency and asynchronicity is built into these combinators. You can't really screw it up. Uh, race conditions are nigh impossible to express because everything is purely functional and uh, follows a stream. And if you build a system using streams, even if you initially don't have a reactive system, if you change it to one later on, you get uh, to react to that system for free whenever your inputs change. Uh, so basically, languages are starting to adapt to the previous abstractions that we've talked about. So a uh, long time ago, go-tos weren't a thing, then languages started supporting them. Functions weren't a thing, languages started supporting them. Uh, now, actually, we can start to see 
uh, things like callbacks and asynchronous workflows? Well, a lot of newer languages like Golang have concurrency primitives built in. You have Go functions. Rust has asynchronous primitives. JavaScript has async await. This is uh, the evolution of language catching up with us. Well, we're just bridging a new frontier now into reactive systems, and I truly believe that new languages coming out, uh, for instance, Elm is, is basically on the cusp of this, are building in reactive systems as a language concept, and I think that's really exciting. Does anyone have questions for me? 50-50 ticket? Got one over there. really want to win the 50-50. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, do you think that with all the reactive stuff that's been coming out lately, that there's going to be lots of advances in this technology as far as its uses? Or are we seeing a lot of this explosion of reactive stuff now and it's going to peter out? Or what, do you have any thoughts about the future of what this technology is going to give us? Sure. So uh, there's a really good talk um, by Evan Chaplicki. Uh, he invented Elm. It's on YouTube. Uh, I think it's called something about a time traveling wizard. You can look it up. Uh, it's a talk he gave at Strange Loop. And he talks about a lot of the current problems that do exist with this model right now. And I think in order to advance and hit that next level, we're going to need to study and recognize the structures that are inherent with this approach and the problems that come out of it. So for instance, when you're dealing with, uh, this gets a little bit more advanced, but when you're dealing with higher order uh, stream-based systems, which what I mean by higher order is the idea that you can add new streams at runtime or you can take them away, uh, the compiler can't do any optimization over that. So what that means is if you have a library of streams, let's say uh, the keyboard input, and your original program isn't listening to keyboard input, now you decide to graft that into your program. Well, do you care about all of the keys that the user hit before you grafted it in? Because if you do, then your program needs to be tracking that the entire time just in case you decide to use it, which is a huge performance problem. You now need to track every stream that you could possibly ever want to use, right? So there are a lot of um, basically paradigm shifting ideas that we need to figure out how we want to handle these. Do we decide to just throw all of those events away um, in order to make this kind of a structured thing? And they do have a couple different, basically, names for uh, levels of stream programming, right? So there's first order FRP, which does not allow grafting in streams. There's higher order FRP, which does allow grafting in streams. And then there's a few other types of static FRP, which are even more highly optimized. So uh, I would definitely recommend that talk um, if you get a chance. Awesome, thanks. Anybody else? Great, thanks. Thank you, Chris. Uh, next up, we have Jesse Rollheiser. He's been with Vendasta for a few years now, started as a developer, worked his way up to a team lead, is now the developer advocate for our infrastructure division. When Jesse is not here at Vendasta coding and not at home sleeping, you can find him at the volleyball court. He goes there all the time. Everything else in his life is volleyball. Kind of a lie. He only plays eight times a week. But welcome, Jesse. Are you taking a break or no? No? Okay, so I wanted to start this talk with how I start a conversation with any new group of people or a bunch of strangers and tell them that I have two problems in life. Um, it's not how I start every s conversation. I say, uh, my name is Jesse Rollheiser. I'm a software developer at Findasta. So I tell them my name before I tell them my problems. Uh, my problems being that I'm a software developer who works at Vendasta. Um, these might not sound like problems, but with a bit of added context, um, my girlfriend here is a nurse. Um, so when we go out and meet strangers together like we like to do, they ask her, and then she says she's a nurse, and they're like, oh, that's so cool. Like, what hospitals do you work at? That's really awesome. So good of you. Versus the response that I get, which is like, oh, you're a software developer. Cool. Like, 
printers and stuff, I guess. Um, it's getting a little better now that there's so many application developers. Like, I can just be like, oh, you know, like Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram. They're like, oh, you build those? I'm like, yeah, sure, kind of. <laughs> but so they kind of get it, which is nicer. But second problem being I work at Vendasta, very similar. When I go and hang out with any of the people that I know in the tech industry, like if I go out with Romeo, he gets to say I make appointment scheduling software for businesses. Uh, Logan at NC Smart Call gets to say I make shift scheduling software for healthcare staff. And Joey gets to say I make shift scheduling software for restaurant staff. And my, my problem is that I don't work at a software scheduling business. Um, <laughs> I get to say I work at Vendasta, which is the number one platform for selling digital solutions to small or lo local businesses. And so the response is like, oh, cool, like, what? <laughs> um, so the follow-up is like, what do you, like, what does Vendasta actually do? So I've never found a good way to explain this. Danny tried her best uh, right before, which I applaud. I usually give a quick, quick history lesson, which is 10 years ago, our co-founders had this idea that, you know, the cell phones and the internet that were just being developed um, are going to be huge for local businesses to survive online. Um, people go check the internet, they check online reviews before they make a purchase. So they built a bunch of foundational products for businesses like reputation software, social media management, listings management, and that turned out to be super important 10 years ago. The problem we encountered after that was selling software is so difficult. It's tough to call Texas and be like, oh hey, it's Joe from Canada, want to buy some software. They say no almost every time. Um, so we partnered with, uh, we made a white label platform that resellers could sell our software. They can slap their own name on it. We really capitalized on the newspaper companies because they were in steady decline because who reads and buys the newspaper anymore? Um, after that, we have a really good relationship with these resellers and they basically just want more stuff to sell. So what we decided to do, instead of building a whole bunch of applications, which is really difficult, we found those people that were having the same issues we had four years ago, selling. So now we integrate vendors into our system so that we basically solve their distribution problem for them. Um, so to kind of, um, sorry. So today, Vendasta, we have about 1,200 resellers reselling our software. Uh, combined, they have about 22,000 salespeople. Uh, reach about just over a million businesses and they have about 50 products they can offer to these small business owners. So to kind of sum up all of that stuff going on, I tell people that I work at Vendasta, which is this number one platform for selling digital solutions to local businesses. So getting back to my problems that I said at the very start, I said that I'm a software developer at Vendasta, which I kind of lied is only really one problem. It's that I find it very difficult to relate to people when we don't have something in common that we're interested or excited about. Um, so my new second problem is that I'm so excited about managing data streams. And I want to get more people excited about data streams because I want to relate to people about it. Um, so my goal is to make data streams more relatable to people. Um, I want to build on what Chris and Ryan already talked about. They've done a fantastic job introducing it. And I just want to make it really resonate with people today. So in order to manage data streams, you first have to really know what they're about. And both Ryan and Chris talked about this. A data stream is a series of events. That's, that's all there is to it. It's just a series of events over time, basically anything. When I was driving to work today, I was like, oh, this is a, just a series of events. I, I see a traffic light, that's an event. Then I press my gas pedal, I see a yellow light, I press it more, I <laughs> push the brake, I hear a crappy song on the radio, I turn it off. It's all these events and eventually I get to work or a series of events like basically everything going on in this room right now. The entire universe is just a series of events that we can choose to be an observer in. Um, I'm publishing a whole bunch of events right now, all of the words coming out of my mouth. Everyone in this room, you're observing these events that I'm publishing out into the room. Some people are subscribing, listening to what I'm saying. Some people choose to ignore me, that's fine. Um, but basically, it's nice that everyone's isolated in their experience. So whatever I say and whoever hears it, they can choose to do what they want. Stealing one of Ryan's diagrams, um, put myself at the top here. I'm publishing out all these events. The channel is the air that connects my mouth to your ears. 
Um, there's a whole bunch of different subscribers in the room too. There's your ears. There's this microphone right in front of my face that's getting the same data that I'm sending out. Uh, there's also this camera in my face that's recording everything and streaming it to the screens. So I propagate out this event and then each observer gets to act independently from one another. So this microphone's the first one that catches the event. It just amplifies my voice because I'm kind of soft-spoken and sick. Uh, then it probably hits your ears and then you can choose to text instead of listening. <laughs> and then the camcorder gets the exact same events and then it's kind of making a recording or streaming it. I'm not 100% sure what it's doing. Uploading it to somebody else's computer, who knows. Live stream, cool. Who's watching the live stream? <laughs> Um, so I said I, would, I wanted to teach you about managing data streams. I've just wanted to first get everybody on the same ground page of what data streams are. So data streams are just series of events that can essentially be codified. So when we talk about data streams as opposed to event streams, it's just like something that can be codified like a user event, like a mouse click or a finger tap. So to visual, I wanted to visualize some of this. So what I did was built a small application, which I'll spin up now. Instead of me just screaming out a bunch of stuff at people, I'll reload this. So I could just say like, oh, I'm gonna spout off a bunch of numbers. Hopefully you guys can write them all down. We have computers that can do automatic stuff now. So I've got this button, which adds one. And then I've got this listener here that's basically listening and writing down all the numbers. Um, and so what I wanted to demonstrate next now, I've got this master stream of numbers that are coming in. And what I can do is I can make child streams off of this. So I'll let this reload. I've got my master stream on the left. And if I just send a whole bunch of numbers down the stream, I've got some filters set up so that the even numbers, it just ignores anything that's not even. The prime one doesn't care about anything that's not prime. And it's very simple to do this. So now what happens, and Chris was getting to this in his talk, um, say I take a completely random number, like a billion and seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, what, seven. My entire application is blocked right now because JavaScript, as a lot of you know, is single threaded. So it took a while to crunch through that. So typically what we do as developers is we don't want to do these computationally intensive things on the front end. We defer those to some back end, and then we make a request for data to the back end, and then it's up to our front ends to orchestrate how they're going to handle all these responses. So to build kind of a real life example, every time I think about you know making a request for something, getting it delivered back to myself, I like to think about food, of course. So I want to build a small tiny application that I've got this breakfast menu. So instead of just shouting numbers at my computer, I'm gonna shout numbers and it's gonna give me a bunch of food back. So I've got this food request queue. So instead of just printing out numbers, I'll show you all the requests I'm making. Cool, I printed out the numbers again. And this is kind of a nice side effect of reactive programming is that it can be lazily evaluated. Since no one actually cares about these requests yet, we haven't actually done any work. Um, so in order to do some work, someone needs to subscribe and care. Like if, kind of the classic dilemma of if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to listen, does anyone care? Um, <laughs> if I just say like, oh, make eggs, and it's not for anyone, it's like, should you even make the eggs in the first place? Um, so let's add our first observer to this uh, food request queue. And basically, the managing data streams part that I want to talk about were the three main strategies we use at Findasta to manage our data. The first one being what I kind of refer to as a drive-through, or the concat map that Ryan and Chris alluded to. So if you have a bunch of food requests to process and you own a drive-through, I'm going to request all these things. Each one takes um, a fifth of a second longer to process than the last one. And you can see all of our requests are there and we have to process them one after another. Um, so if you're the poor guy that was at the back of the line when some guy ordered like 30 things at Tim Hortons, you gotta wait for everyone else. There's not really like a speed up lane at a drive-through. So the second way that I want to introduce is what I call kind of the restaurant style of processing events. So this is the merge map if you're in reactive terms. 
So this is nice when you have a whole bunch of kitchen staff that can process events. They can really take advantage of parallelization. So I queue up all my orders, and then you'll notice that they happen a lot quicker now because basically everything gets queued up and then everything starts processing. I'll bring back the drive through just to compare them. If I queue up, say, the first 20 things, the merge map finishes a lot quicker than the drive through. So, like, who cares? Like, why would I ever use concat map over merge map? The thing that matters is if you go in the other order, so we were doing kind of a happy path where every request we made was longer than the previous one. Say we wanted to start with chicken waffles. If I put these in and just wait my four seconds, both of them serve it at the exact same time. So that's because they only had one request to process. If I go in the reverse order now, though, and go all the way back down to here, you'll see that my merge map, it did process every request, but the order that it got all the results was kind of in a random order. Even though I queued up order number one and two at the end, they actually got resolved right after I was finished queuing up events because it's super easy to deliver a high five or a smile to a customer when you've got 100 staff working for you. But in the drive through case, it's still unfortunate for these people at the end that all they wanted was a bottle of water and they got to wait for the guys ordering grilled cheeses still. Um, the last processing method that I wanted to introduce was kind of a special case, but we use it a lot at Vendasta, which is the switch map, which I like to think of being like the personal chef for a millionaire who's very particular and changes his mind very frequently. So I might start off just saying like, oh, just give me a number one, give me a smile, cool, done. I want a high five, done. And then if I go all the way to the, just order a whole bunch of things, I'll sit there and wait. And basically, he was changing his mind the whole time. He said, you know, give me all these things, but at the end of the day, he just wanted this one thing. You cancel all of that other stuff you were doing. So to bring those back, all three of them, we can compare them side by side. So now let's start with the chicken waffles again. So we wait our four seconds. Everyone gets it at the same time. The processing time doesn't change for any of these implementations, but now if I go back through and switch this up a bit, the drive throughs slowly chugging away at everything. The merge map we see again delivered everything in kind of whatever order it happened to end in. And at the end of the day, this chef, eventually he's like, oh, you just want a bottle of water? I can just deliver that, no problem. Um, so really what strategy you use depends on your use case. But the really nice thing about reactive programming that Chris was really getting at was how composable these are. I don't want to show too much code, but the code that separates what happens in these, I have a drive through stream, a restaurant stream, and a personal chef stream. They're all based on the same parent stream of requests coming in. The only difference is the operator that we used to define these streams. So one uses a concat map, one uses a merge, one uses a switch and you get such a wide variety of functionality with almost no code change. So it's super easy. You have a lot of flexibility to provide a wide variety of use cases. The last part that I wanted to talk about briefly was just how we use this at Vendasta a little bit. So I wanted to take us into our reputation management product. Don't need to know a ton about this, but this is for a BMW dealership in San Francisco. It's got these 9,000 reviews. We do some analytics on it, provide them the actual reviews that it can look at. There's a lot of context on this page that the user can switch between, and there's a lot going on. So in each of these boxes, say on the far left side or the star ratings, we don't care what order those get rendered in. Uh, we basically just want all of the data, so we'll just merge those together. We can make all those requests merge them, doesn't matter the order. Whereas something like when they actually interact with the page, it's very contextual, it's very important to what they're doing. So if they search like, oh, I want all my cat reviews, no, I want all my dog reviews, no, I want all my mouse reviews. If I did all these requests and at the end of the day I had reviews about dogs, the user would be very frustrated. They're like, I didn't actually want this in the end. I, I know I requested it like two seconds ago, but 
I changed my mind. Um, so here's the mouse reviews. So this, we typically take the context of the page and we'll switch map on it like, like we're a personal chef for the user. Um, and then the last thing um, that I got to work on that I just wanted to share quickly was about uh, how we used Reactive to solve kind of our internationalization strategy. So in our application, we have this translate service that provides all of the text for the entire application. Everyone's just listening in. They don't care where it comes from. Um, but really at the bottom here, you can say, oh, give me French instead. And then since everyone's already listening, they're just updated automatically. Their context changed way back in the parent stream that says, this application's being served in English. And then everyone just, with their peer functions and their transforms and whatever else they're doing, just displays at the end. So I can switch back to English now. Um, so hopefully that made everyone else excited about, as, or as excited about data streams as I am, because that's really all I had to talk about. I wanted to provide some visual examples, but if anyone has any questions, I'd definitely be open. If not, oh, really? Yeah. Test? Okay. Your examples were all for front-end applications. Um, yep. Do you feel that reactive programming would be a useful paradigm for back-end programming tasks? Oh, definitely. And that's kind of a direction we're taking with some of the newer services we'll be building as well, is building these, uh, you need a lot of historical context. We switched to a microservice infrastructure. And as we're trying to broadcast events out into our system, trying to not do it in an imperative way is going to be extremely important for us. So in order to build these services in such a way that they're just taking in inputs and emitting outputs is going to be extremely important for us. We don't want it to be, you know, you've got some master microservice that imperatively coordinates all the work you do in your entire ecosystem. Um, it's going to be very important that we adopt some reactive patterns in our backends as well. Thank you, Jesse. We're just going to take a few minutes. Uh, it's your last, very last chance to buy 50, some 50-50 tickets. Katrina will add up the numbers, and in five minutes here, we'll uh, do the draw for 50-50. Uh, if you're not interested in that, please feel free to stay. We're going to be here for another hour or so. Enjoy some more drink, enjoy some more food, and conversation.